Hello and welcome to another very special episode of The Brave Room. With me today, we have Kang Tai, who is the senior esports lead at Razer. Say hello to the lovely people of the internet. Hi, internet. Yeah, I love you. <laughs> that, that makes one of us. Now, as always, you know, if this episode hits 2,000 plays, we will force to take one of your terrible suggestions. So leave them in the comments. And remember, it's a team effort. If you give me an easy suggestion, I will take that one. So make sure the suggestions are good. So we are here because Razer recently announced you guys are doing the Razer Invitational this year. That's right. Yeah, it's our new season. It's your new season. Do you want, you want to talk a bit about that? Sure. Razer Invitational was really born out of the success of what we did at SEA Games back in 2019. You know, working with different federations, bringing them together, fielding teams. I think we realized that we wanted to give sort of the, the tier two amateur players that opportunity to compete when they normally wouldn't be able to, giving them a chance to, to shine. And, you know, what you see in the esports world today is like, you know, what catches everyone's eye on Twitch or YouTube. You see like the big productions, the million dollar prizes, things like that. And, you know, there are like tons of esports tournaments at the lower level where people are winning, like, or competing for $50, $100, bucks, you know. So, you know, what this tournament really does is, you know, serve the underserved. It really serves the community of players who are really looking to get to that next level. And we launched the tournament in Southeast Asia last year. We expanded to Latin America, and then we went to Europe. And now this year, we're kicking it off with North America. So really, really excited. We announced the tournament last week, and you know we're featuring three games for All Stars, Rainbow Six, and Fortnite. And we think it's going to be a really, really awesome event. We've also brought on a couple sponsors so far that I can talk about. One is Intel, and the other is Seagate. And we're really happy to have them be a part of this. I'm glad that you brought that up about the whole like about the whole serving the underserved thing, because I think there is definitely a sort of like image problem. Not not say image problem with esports, but there's like people only think of the big main stage events with you know the Red Bull T-shirts and the everyone mm -hmm. doing the same pose. But people forget that esports was grassroots for the longest time before. For the longest time, yeah. Yeah, before That's ESPN. Right. I was I spent a year abroad in the UK and every Sunday we would go down to this pub where we'd play fighting games in the back like they had an arrangement with the pub where they right. would have they would get a few tables and play and I, and I thought like this is what it should be for most people but that's right that's right I mean I remember growing up going to the arcades with my cousin and you see lines of people playing Street Fighter uh, at the time it was Street Fighter 2 and mm -hmm. Uh, which I, I guess I just dated myself, right? <laughs> That's okay, we do it all the time here. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just seeing the intensity, like, you know, watching this this community get together and, you know, spend their weekend at the arcade competing. And and it wasn't even for money at the time, you know? It was just for bragging rights. Yeah. Uh, that's that's where esports really, like, grew from. Yeah. Did you ever go to, like, any cyber cafes? Where I live in, in the U.S., uh, there weren't any cyber cafes. So. Ah, okay. Because uh, yeah. when I was in high school, everyone would go to cyber cafes after school. And again, mm -hmm. like that was where a lot of this all started because you would go to the cyber cafe and you could only play LAN games at the time. Yeah, You could only play whatever game everyone else was playing against mm -hmm. everyone else in the cafe. And I remember because my friend would give himself stupid nicknames. Like he would put his name as, because you know in the Source Engine games you can change your name on the fly, right? So he mm -hmm. would he would change his name to like your mom. So it says you were killed by your mom, <laughs> and and whoever got killed would get up and be like, who who is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and that's like you know the history of you know competitive gaming. There's always like a little bit of trash talking, a little bit of you know. It's, it's it's healthy, you know? You see it in all different kinds of sports. It's like, hey, you know, I'm you're lighting that fire, you've got that like that fire in you to, to compete. You gotta you gotta trash talk just a little bit, you know? If you wanna be the best. I think a little bit of trash talking is necessary. Yeah, definitely. And so it's it's really great to see that, you know, Razor is doing that with the Razor Invitational. You had an invitational last year as well. 
that was a little bit more difficult because you know the world ended and everything yeah it was supposed to be a LAN event and we were very lucky that we could easily pivot to an online tournament you know i I think it made things a little bit more feasible for us Uh, you know we we got you know a lot of visibility out of it and it was it was a great event we were very very successful with it that's good to know because i was checking obviously you're doing uh Southeast Asia season at a later date, but the North America is the first one here. And Correct. yeah, last year you had a Southeast Asia one as well. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. was the roster of games at all impacted by the whole world ending thing? Because last year's lineup was Dota 2, Mobile Legends, and PUBG Mobile. Were there any games you guys had to like scrap for that? No, we didn't really have to scrap any games. Usually, like how we choose games is we look at the competitive schedule for different titles that we're interested in. We talk to the publishers or developers to ensure that there aren't any like conflicts in you know, visibility or you know conflicts in, in their competitions. So we want to make sure and, and usually what they tell us is like, you know, we, we they don't want us like competing with their you know their pro tournament schedules. But obviously like as I mentioned before, these terms are really meant for a different set of, of competitors. Yeah, they're they're meant to be like you know, I I don't have a fancy esports backing, but I would like to enter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and about the games too. It's like we we always want to, you know, choose the best and the top titles in the region. You know, so in North America, we had looked at you know CS:GO, we had looked at League of Legends, Valorant, things like that. But you know, due to out of schedules and things like that, we had to you know look at other opportunities as well, or like whittle our list down to ones that we. That we could work with. That's a, that's interesting to know. I assume you know, as Razer's king of esports, you have access to like the information about the people who watch this stuff. How did that fly last year with the Southeast Asia crowd? Oh, it was it was awesome. It was so good. I mean, I think in that tournament, you know, our viewership was just phenomenal. It was so so good, considering it was our first go at it, and I think we had something close to like eight or ten million views for our tournament you know and so for our, our launch of this ip like i'd say we, we were pretty successful yeah because again looking at the southeast asia lineup you picked some real winners there they've dota 2 mobile legends and pubg mobile those are literally like as someone who and i'm, I'm gonna make this very unprofessional as someone who goes on tinder a lot those are the three games <laughs> that everyone who says they're a gamer <laughs> plays <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean like the hottest games in the region right you know, I think that lineup may change, you know, in this next year. I mean, now that Wild Rift is out and people are playing that, you know, I think Riot will make that game as successful as possible in Southeast Asia. So As, as they do. Uh, yeah, as they do. So it may not be like MLBB. It may not be Dota 2. It could be Wild Rift and something else. So it just, we'll, we'll have to see when we, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's just easier to, to go off of what we do know, which was how last year's one turned out. There's one thing, and I'm almost kind of nervous to ask you about this. Because, you know, like you said, Razor Invitational, it's basically like... Wh- why is it called an Invitational if it's like an if it's like open to everyone? Right. <laughs> it's, it's a really funny question. And I think you're absolutely right. It is an open, and that's how it started. This tournament has really evolved over the past like few times we've run it, and we are actually inviting influencers to play people from the community to play and so you know i think you can sort of see the evolution of where you know where we're going it won't be just you know for amateurs to just be an open and and qualify for it we're moving towards something bigger you know that uh, i think you know the invitational i guess word will be very very relevant that's a that's a very democratic answer to that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I the, try. That, that actually wasn't my question. That was just I came up with that while trying to phrase my question. <laughs> but my actual question was as Game of Bray's resident fighting games evangelist, I can't help but notice the lack of fighting games on this list. Is it like yeah. is it because your mission statement would be a little too similar to evil? It would be and we don't want to, you know, compete with like you know with the likes of evo you know i think it just comes down to what 
at what games are we think are going to be really popular, are going to drive participation and viewership. We, I mean, obviously, Razer is, is a company that is for gamers by gamers, right? We want to give the opportunity to for everyone to compete. And you know, back at Sea Games 2019, you know, Tekken was you know part of that lineup. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, it, I mean, a fighting game could be a part of any of these tournaments. You know, what it comes down to is, you know, operational costs for a tournament organizer to add an, an additional title. You know, you have to get influencers, you know, people to help drive that viewership. You know, all of it comes down to, you know, do we have the resources and the talent necessary to have a great experience for everyone to, to participate in and watch? So there's the compromises, I guess you could say, that we would have to make. Oh, yeah, definitely. One of the biggest, like, misconceptions people have is that the fighting game crowd thinks that we are the mainstream we like i think the entire fgc knows we are not the most popular like multiplayer game by a long shot it's kind of a shame i think like why you know the fighting game community hasn't grown to you know something like a like a bigger audience because one, it's fast. It, everyone understands like what the objective is, right? Yeah. To, to beat your opponent down, right? To body them, <laughs> right? But then, like when you look at games like League of Legends or Dota, those games are so complicated. You have to understand like each character's strength and weaknesses. You have to understand their build paths. You have to understand like objectives and map map control, vision. That is way more complicated than you know fighting games, to me. Right, yeah, that's... and I'm not I'm not in the scene, but like, you know, you you hear stories from CN and like how he has to train, like, and learn like the the size of the hitbox, and you know, for all different characters, and like knowing all the thousands of moves for each of them, it is complicated in that sense. But from an audience perspective, it's way more accessible. The thing with MOBAs is like it's not visually apparent if the cool mm -hmm. thing is happening right now, because. Of, I've watched like some mobile games live before and you know someone's like kiting and running away and the crowd will go wild and you're like yeah. is that a cool thing that's happening when you know in truth kiting is like super technical and really really impressive yeah. yeah but unless you know that it's like this is a weird thing to watch whereas in Street Fighter the guy's bar is empty he yeah. did yeah. <laughs> oh my god I peaked, yeah. I peaked my audio levels there <laughs> 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 I follow up Markman twenty three, right? He's, I'm sure, I'm sure you know him. But um, he had posted something like a few months ago, or maybe about a year ago. Like, what is it, Evo? Like moment thirty seven. Yeah, yeah. I always like come back to it, right? Because even though I was not there, I didn't know anything about what was happening at the time. But watching Daigo like make that like those those moves. Yeah, the parries. And, yeah, yeah, the parries, and it's just like that is. That is so amazing. That is so incredible. And it really, I, I think as from an audience perspective, you have to be able to appreciate what just happened in front of you. Even though you don't know exactly what happened, like you see everyone rising out of their seats and screaming their heads off and you know something special just like, just happened. And so like, I just wish there were more moments like that where could be could be better publicized and, and have better visibility because the, the fighting game community really needs that I, I think to grow um yes it's still niche but it shouldn't be and i hope that you know through our efforts at razor we can help bring that visibility to more people through players like cn players like fudo you know i think those guys are just incredible players and you know we, we hope to support more of the fgc like soon so earlier you mentioned like you know influencers are a part of you know marketing your your esports event, mm -hmm. and just wanted to clarify here like when you say influencers, you mean like community influencers, right? Like oh, for correct, a, correct. for a game, like you're not calling Belle Delphine to come in and and sell <laughs> Mobile Legends. <laughs> no, no, we um like for Razor Invitation North America, one of the titles as I mentioned before is Brawl Stars, and we happen to sponsor and partner with tribe gaming one of the biggest mobile content creation teams in north america if not the biggest content creation team for mobile gaming in north america and one of their key games is brawl stars so we have created a bracket 
where on one side of the bracket, I've invited their content creators to play and feel the team of them, plus like some of their community and their fans to play with them and try to make it to the grand final. So those are the kinds of like influencers that, that I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to have, I'd love to, to host. And we've invited some influencers to cast the events. So what it comes down to is Razor Invitational North America is a really special event for the community. And the only way to help the, the community is one is letting them know that, that awareness that this tournament is happening and it's for them. And the only way they, they can know that is through either social or their, the influencers that they follow. And so that's why we brought on influencers to help us get the word out. Yeah, I think this would be a great conversation for another time. But like people really underestimate how important influencers are in like shaping your event. Oh, absolutely. I, I think in the past for our invitation in Southeast Asia, we did work with Tier 1, a great, great team of, of people led by Trike. And those guys are just putting together a massive, massive following. You know, we had uh, some, we worked with some of their uh, influencers, like I think it was uh, Beyond Cake, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a, a variety streamer. And she, she helped like drive awareness for our tournament. And it was, it was a great experience. So we've talked about the Razor Invitational. I do have mm -hmm. one thing I want to pick your brain on. So the Razor Kishi, that looks like God's gift to mobile gaming to me, because I like it some is. mobile games. But I do not like using my phone. I do not like touching the screen. It is it makes me uncomfortable. So the idea of I can stick two halves of controller on it and now it's a controller, that's great. So we did our write-up on the Razor Kishi and we posted it to a group and someone told me that controller type peripherals are banned in some in some mobile game tournaments. That's right. So I wanted to know what your opinion on that was. Aside from the fact that, you know, it's Razor's job to sell these third-party peripherals. <laughs> <laughs> First off, the, the Razor Kishi is, uh, is an amazing device. Mm -hmm. And we have partnered with a lot of publishers and developers to, like, ensure that there is the um, support for their, their game titles. Like, uh, I think Brawlhalla, I think there's, like, Call of Duty Mobile for iOS. You know, I, I think what Kishi provides is a new way to play. Right? It doesn't necessarily give you some kind of unfair advantage or anything like that in competition. It's just, you know, you have buttons versus using your fingers on the screen. And like I myself, I don't like playing, you know, games on my phone with just just my fingers because you end up getting like streaks or even like burns because like the, how fast you swipe. So I know it's uncomfortable for a lot of people. And that's why like that's part of the reason why the Kishi was developed. As for being banned in competition, one you know, if if the game is supported, I can understand why a developer would want want to not have third party peripherals in tournaments, and that's to ensure that everyone is having sort of a standard across all players. So all players must play on the same platform. Right? Yeah, and I totally get it. And what we've been trying to do is work with our uh, developer partners to one have one support for the game. But two, we've asked about like having exhibition matches to show people like, hey, you know, you don't have to play on your phone. You know, you can play on your Kishi and your device, either through a Bluetooth connection or through like the, the um, direct connection on, on yeah, the, the sandwich on, mode through the port. Right. So that's just a new, really amazing experience. So you have multiple ways to play and you can enjoy it how you want to. And Kishi can give you that variability and the opportunity to play more comfortably so however you want to want to play it's a challenge for sure i think in the near future when you know players are standing up and asking for more of these kinds of you know experiences like using a controller i think it's we'll see them in competition hopefully sooner rather than later though yeah definitely and i, I like the fact that you brought that up the idea of the standard versus the everyone should play what makes them play best because again to, to bring it back that's pretty much how fighting game tournaments go that's why you have you know controller players versus stick players uh -huh. versus hitbox players right because right. They... like a problem x right he plays on controller yeah and so like i think the a lot of esports groups communities in general need to start having that conversation about hey 
do we think that maybe it's time to let players play the way that makes them play best with a huge asterisk saying an aimbot does not count all right <laughs> aimbot right. Is, is not a not an accessibility feature all right <laughs> but yeah definitely and i think this this would be the last question for this sure. okay so i think we've we've definitely hit like a turning point on attitudes towards esports mm. Like I think people go less from you can make money playing video games question mark to you can make money playing video games period weird period. Yeah. Thing <laughs> with we've definitely made we've made that jump in the past few years, and a yeah. lot more people are definitely a lot more supportive, especially yeah. especially in Asian countries now where they're like, yeah you know my my kid he's really into Fortnite so we let him like we let him play because he wants to get good professionally. And I think that's great, right? Yeah, it's absolutely great. But <laughs> and this is where it comes. Here it comes. In. Here it comes <laughs> in. There is also the problem that if you're gonna spend, you know, all your free time playing video games, you know, there is still the risk that you are not going to develop socially as a person, <laughs> especially if you're playing a game like what's a name drop Counter Strike, where the community is famously very toxic. Yeah. I think esports has has changed. It's gone. It's gone more mainstream. And I think just to talk about the first part, you know, parents are getting more involved, which is great. They're teaching their their kids like how to how to be safe, uh, playing games, interacting with people online. You know, also just limiting the amount of playtime on computers. I think is a good thing. I mean, I'm a I'm a parent myself, right? I have two kids. Mm-hmm. And I want them to enjoy video games. I want them to play. Like, do I want them to play competitively? Sure, if they really want to. But I think everything comes with moderation. You know, if you want to be the best, yeah, sure, you have to put a little bit more time in. But I wouldn't want my child to play like hours and hours and hours on end without like going out for a run or something like that and playing the playground. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there come there comes with uh, with this there comes like a necessity for balance and sort of oversight by the by a parent or an adult who can keep ensure and educate their child like how to play and play well but play healthy and that education is something that teammates uh, are, are really talking about now and we're we'll be you know we haven't announced it yet but we are looking at health and wellness for esports and gaming so it's something to look forward to uh, in the near future now, to talk about the, the other part, which is toxicity in gaming. You know, I, I used to play, I used to play League. Yeah, that's know. a great, great way to start a conversation on toxicity, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I know exactly, like, the kind of uh, language, communication, lack of communication that happens in game. And it's great that, like, a publisher, like Riot, has taken steps to combat toxicity, because... That kind of like harassment, that kind of language isn't healthy at all for anyone, whether you're, you're saying it or you're on the receiving end. And, you know, and, and I think where I kind of I feel it's important is for, like I said, parents to really educate their kids and teach their kids how to respect other people. I think that's where it, I think where it should start. And yeah, like I, I kind of mentioned at the beginning, like, yeah, sure, it's when you're competing. Yeah, sure, there's a little bit of trash talking. But it's not cool when you're, like, putting someone down just to put someone down. Yeah. You know, it's not something that should be perpetuated. And you're just teaching the next generation of, like, how to not treat people with respect. And you should always treat your, like, competitors and your teammates with respect. And when they make mistakes, you don't, know, like, talk them down. You have to encourage them and try better next time. And I think what esports and what, what video games do is actually they're very, very social tools or tools to be social rather. And, you know, when you're communicating with your teammates, you're you're talking over comms and you're planning, you're strategizing like that is social activity. Sure, you're not seeing someone face to face. Maybe you're not shaking their hand. But, you know, a lot of the things that we do is, you know, talking over the phone and talking over like you know our headsets interacting with people in these kind of communities that i think is is really healthy in a way because you know in a covid situation a lot of people are just at home yeah you know they they aren't going out right yep. so this is video video games have come in to like sort of save the day 
And so I think it's it's really awesome that our industry has really stepped up and been there for people when or when they needed it most. So when it comes to, like I said, like, you know, uh, toxicity and, and, you know, negative behaviors uh, online, that's sort of like an internal thing that needs to be addressed by parent, child, and, you know, look, looking at someone's values internally. Right. Like if you if you feel that it's cool to put someone down, like while they're playing, then you have problems like like within yourself that you need to, to resolve. Yeah, definitely. I think when you, you mentioned that you do learn social skills while, while playing team games, I think the most basic social skill you learn is to not talk over other people because, you know, like your voice chat can only handle one voice at a time. So I think like, yeah. We we were tricked into learn into learning proper etiquette the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> this and on on topic of toxicity as well. I don't know if you're aware of this Twitter account. It's called Scrub Quotes. No, I'm not familiar with it. It's basically any time someone is being toxic, they send toxic messages in a game. People screenshot mm-hmm. it and send it to this Twitter account to post. And it is the most sobering experience ever because we've all had a scrub quote thought right in our head. Yeah. Like we've all yeah. lost the game and been like, this character's broken, I wish they'd fix him. When the yeah. truth is, no, you just weren't playing your best that day. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> likely the case like 99% of the time. Yeah, right? and we, we've all thought about it, we hold it deep in our hearts sometimes and then we see scrub quotes, you know, an account that is not at all like hiding the fact that it is making fun of these people who say these and you're like oh yeah no i was i was being a scrub (laughs) yeah i think in our in our industry there's a necessity for like emotional intelligence uh education yeah definitely. like how a player deals with their negative feelings how they deal with negative feelings from other players how they deal with pressure those are things that i think you know are so important to the health and growth of our industry i hear like i i've been joining a lot of like twitter spaces recently and just to listen in on like what the community is saying about you know what it's like to be a pro what it's like to you know how how they can grow their 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 followings and it's it's amazing to hear young children like you hear their voices and you can tell they're like maybe 11 10 to 12 years old and they're always like they're saying like i'm so bad at this game like how can i get better and it's it that in itself is very sobering because they're chasing like their idols yeah who are these like youtubers like creating videos who have millions of views and they're like oh yeah i only have two subs right now like how do i get to 100 how do i get to a thousand i'm like well, don't forget why you're playing the game. You're playing the game because it's fun. You're playing the game because you're interacting with your friends. You're not playing the game to like, you know, have a million, yeah, you know, have, have a million viewers, follows, yeah, subs on YouTube. And it, and I think losing sight of that is it, that's really bad. I, I think you know, young kids just need to have fun playing games. That's what kids should do. Not worry about like you know making their you know first million you know like views on youtube like i think that's just crazy it's the wrong like i think it's the wrong attitude and and goal to have yeah definitely i have a game that i played with my friend it's the pokemon fighting game Mm -hmm. and i i tell this story at parties all the time we would we would play we played like 60 matches in one sitting and the final (laughs) score was like 45-15, 45-15, his win. <laughs> <laughs> and my more competitive friends will tell me like, dude, aren't you like, you know, don't you feel like destroyed? Like, you, like he beat you 3-1. to one. And, and I'm just like, no, man, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See that, and that's the attitude to have. It's like, you already know that, you know, despite losing that many games, it's like, it's just a game. And in and for you know when, if you're at the pro level maybe it's not maybe it's not just a game anymore it's your job yeah well, when right? it's your job That's it's different. different yeah it's different and so money is on the line your reputation is online when you get to that level it's different but when you're a kid come on like enjoy the game and if you're good at it great it's not keeping the lights on yet so don't treat it like it is <laughs> exactly <laughs> right 
I'm trying to imagine like Daigo trying to pay the electricity bill with, but that match was really fun though. <laughs> <laughs> Telling the electric company, it's no, but you don't understand. Yeah. I, I had a lot of fun. Yeah. Once they flip the switch and the lights go out. Yeah. <laughs> but I think we can call it here for today. Thank you okay. so much for coming on the show. Is there anything you'd like to say to the viewers? Like one more shout out to the Razor Invitational? Yeah, I, I think, you know, what we're doing at Razor is something really special that I think a lot of people need to watch. Knowing that the Razor Invitational is uh, a tournament for the community, it's for the underserved, it's, I think, is, is what makes it unique. And whether you're just watching or you're competing, you know, please just have fun, you know, have fun competing. Hopefully, like, people who sign up and register they, and they win. You know, that's a lot of money, a lot of money on the line. And for those who are watching, you know, we're doing a lot of giveaways and just want to have, just want to make sure that everyone's enjoying it, enjoying their time watching it because we're going to be doing more of these. We're going to be reaching new regions. So please continue to follow Team Razor. And yeah, I think that's it. Can't wait for the Antarctica regional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those, love penguins playing. Those penguins can play a mean uh, wild rift. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. They've got none but time. Yeah. Again, thank you so much for coming on, and thank you, listener, for for listening this far into the into the Brave Room. This has been another episode of the Brave Room. Don't forget, leave a comment. Two thousand plays. You know, I'll have to take one of your suggestions. You you know the shebang by now. This has been the Brave Room, and see you guys next week.